All right, Toby, um, we're live. Excellent. So I, whoa, what's going on here? Uh, so is your cat alive? Is your cat dead <laughs> in that box? And we don't know. Today, we're going to exam examine the fundamentals of quantum electrodynamics. Uh, Alan is going to take it away here, and I've been looking forward to this one for a while. So, yeah, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, thanks. We're going to go over the what I think is like the core fund. Well, first, we're, I'm going to give like an overview of quantum mechanics and like what they say it is, give some background on the history and everything, and then go over what I think is the most pivotal, pivotal experiment put forward for proof of their uh, abstract uh, abstract mathematics. And then we're going, and then obviously we're going to take a real critical examination of that process and see if it's on the, you know, if it, if it, uh, you know, is what they say it is. Okay. So that's the purpose of the presentation. Okay. Next page. <laughs> Let's see. Special shout out to the, the YouTube channel. It's BS fractal woman, uh, and Chan Chong who wrote an excellent paper for us. That will be Chan Chu. Oh, sorry. Chan, dang, my bad. Chan Chu, I apologize. Uh, Chan Chu, shout out to him. Thank you for that. He wrote an excellent paper on the Compton, Compton, on Compton scattering, which really uh, shed some light on this whole thing. It is, it is a very important experiment. Okay, so with that said, we're about to dive into one of the most complex subjects that's put forward. Um, you know, it's shrouded in mystery. There's unanswered paradoxes to decipher. And let's just try... To quote Ru Yang Wang, let us not judge a thing on its appearance. Let us instead try to grasp its essence, right? So let's just see if we can understand what they're talking about and how they're trying to apply it. Right. So it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Uh, in classic mechanics, a, a field is described as a continuous line of force. And in, uh, you know, the, the, the divergence in quantum mechanics is that... Uh, fields are discontinued lines, right? They're, they're discontinued discrete points. They're quantized uh, little moments, right, of energy. And that's where they get their uh, momentum. That's where they get their calculations for the particle state of them, right? So that's the, that's the distinction between the two. So I'm going to read off here a little bit. So by treating the fields as discrete particles, those points can be quantized and represented as momentum in points in the field. By quantizing the disconnectedness of the field into discrete packets of momentum, you can attribute the point like particle you can you can attribute particles to the to that point like uh, discrete packet that you made, right? And within that, you can apply a probability, let's see, you can apply a function of probability to the wave mechanic, and you can introduce like the concept of quantum states where you have uh, you know th this wave particle duality, this on off state simultaneously. So that's kind of where that comes from. And then in addition to that, so a big part of this is uh, the merger of two, two fields, right? So electromagnetic radiation is a conjugate expression of two fields, right? The electric field and the magnetic field. So that's its own separate thing. So when they talk about a photon, that's going to be uh, all electromagnetic radiation. So anything that's, uh, anything that's on that spectrum will be known as a photon. And then they, how they describe that interaction, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get into detail on that. And then separate from that, they have the electron where they quantize the electric field and they use this to describe the subatomic level. And they use the, inter they use the <laughs> photon measurements, right? To, me to make measurements of the subatomic world and all that and get, and get these interactions or like to quantize these interactions and, and, uh, let's see, like verify their mathematics, you know, when they get uh, energy readings. So we will, I think that's, I think that pretty much explains it. Uh, okay. So the, so the new quantization of energy uh, in the discon in the discontinued, uh, you know, structure of it will, uh, will help better explain the subatomic level for their, for them uh, moving forward with the quantum model. Next, we have Maxwell's equation here for the for how they derive C. So what they're saying here is V equals one over the square root of epsilon times mu equals C. Now to what, like, what, what does that mean? Now the way they used to look at the 
um, well, the way that this, this was derived, it's an induction rate, right? So V is vibrations per second. And this is the magnetic permeability, I'm sorry, electric permeativity and the magnetic permeability. So that's how, that's how many vibrations are going to occur in one second with that medium. And then that's going to be equal to C. So anything that's defined as electromagnetic radiation will now prop will, it'll vibrate at that speed, speed per second. So what's the speed of light? 300 million kilometers a second. So you can think of that as 300 million vibrations per second. That is going to be the propagation rate where that's the derived induction rate, right? Because what's happening is for induction to happen, the electric field is accelerating and that is inducing the magnetic field through the charge, poten through the charge potential, right? And that's all, basically what this equation is saying is, you know, there's a wave happening in, in a medium and this is how many waves can happen per second in that medium. All right. Now we get to, oh yeah, so the in that equation, uh, epsilon and mu have zero on them. So it kind of looks like, oh, does that mean that it's zero? Because this is the speed of light in a vacuum, right? This is the lowest amount of impedance that they could uh, measure and get. And this is how, this is what they, this is how fast they determine the induction rate would be, or is. And so those aren't actual zeros. They're just really low numbers, really small numbers. And they're, uh, so the magnetic permeability is measured in Henry, Henry's per meter. And there's the number for that. And then the electric permeativity is measured in farads per meter. And there's the number value for that, that they measured. And the number value actually goes back further, but that's, uh, that's where they lose their quote unquote precision or accuracy or whatever. But that's, uh, that's where they draw the line. So when you see that, that's what they're talking about. How fast an electric current can move through it and how fast a magnetic field can move through it. Uh, you know, the medium. And then oscillations are one, one p or cycles of one second, right? Cool. All right, and then shout out to It's BS who tweeted this today. He gave a little Maxwell gravy on how he derived those, just in case anyone was wondering about, oh, what's the ether? What is it? Like, what do these equations mean? Well, he makes makes it pretty explicit here that he's talking about the the necessity for a medium to be waving for everything to work. All right, now we have, so let's take a look at this. We just talked about an electric field inducing a magnetic field. So let's, this is like what a diagram of that would look like, right? So we have the E field and then it's propagating in some direction. Well, this, you know, it's propagating in some direction. And then perpendicular to that, following the right hand rule, you will have a magnetic field. And in between these uh, peaks, that will be the wavelength for, uh, for the radiation for the wave. So that's uh, kind of what it looks like now. You see these intersection points where there where there's nothing. That would be with the ether, that would be what's accelerating, what's a, what's allow what's allowing that electric field to induce a magnetic field, some would say. Right? And then you can get into Maxwell's displacement current, but that's not really the purpose of this uh, presentation. But that's that's wavelengths. That's what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, primarily here is the measurement of wavelengths and that's what they look like. So it's an electric current or an electric field and a magnetic field. And the wavelength is the distance between the two, two consecutive peaks. All right. So if you Google pictures of an electron, you'll get something that looks like this or some variation. Um, you can't really find the electron because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which we'll get to in a little bit. But basically, the more precisely you determine the momentum of the electron, the least like the more likely you're not able to find it, right? It's a direct proportional ratio or whatever. So um, they have like, you know, you, what is it called? Like CGI images, computer renditions of what it would look like, blah, 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 stuff like that. All right, and then we have Okay, yeah, so we don't really have images of it, but how do we know it's there? So we're gonna get into the history of how they derive the electron in one second. I'm gonna drink some water. All right, so here we have J.J. Thompson in 1897 with his cathode ray experiment. Now to break this down a little bit, what we have is a cathode ray. So this is a vacuum tube that's configured such that you can configure uh, 
you know, an electric wire to it that connects to the anode and cathode in here. And then, then there's a ground that has a slit cut in it. Oh, and the anode also has a slit in it. What, what they're doing here is they're connecting an electric current to this. Uh, and, the, and they're basically that charge potential that's going between the two plates, the, uh, the cathode and the anode here is getting mediated and through the, the through the slits that they that they have basically you could think of it like a collimator essentially so they're just collimating that that pressure mediation through here and then on and then halfway through the tube they have two plates that they use to put an electric field through it and then then they have two magnets where they can do north south magnetic fields and um, when they're inducing the current through there they, you know, they can turn on, they can use a north, uh, the north side of the field, south side, uh, high charge, low charge, et cetera, right? And from that, they can measure the deviation because there's a beam that's created from this, from this charge. They can measure the deviation in that on the, on the opposite end here. So when there's no charge induced or nothing like that, and they're just running this with nothing, with, without, without a magnetic field or an electric current running through it, and it's just the, the just the current coming through on the anode and cathode here. A beam is produced that hits the other end of this, and there's a filament that lights up, and there's little notches and stuff, so they can make really precise measurements here. And then, so so they got their baseline for where it lines up, and then they turn on, and then they introduce a magnetic field, north or south pole. Same with the electric, and they start to get deviations in where it goes. So they determined that the energy that they were putting into this, that they're gonna call the electron, is, you know, that's responsible for electricity, is uh, a negatively charged particle based on how it responded to the uh, electric and magnetic fields, right? Let's see. Okay, that's, the, that's a broad overview of the experiment. And so based on that, J.J. Thompson introduced a coefficient to express charge to mass ratio, right? Because the way that they're conceptualizing this measurement here on the end of this is that there's like a particle here and there's like a, and this is like a ballistic operation going on where there's little tiny particles that are being deflected based off of their charge potential. So J.J. Thompson introduced a coefficient here to derive what the mass of that would be. And how you do that is you have your one fifth. So that's your coefficient for how you're going to distribution, distribute the energy over the radius of the, of the sphere. And then the E squared is the amount of a, a charge that, you, that, that they put into the system, which they could measure so they know how much charge they're putting in. And then let's see, the other one was A was the, was the radius, right? So here's how they derive the radius of it. So based off of based off of the first measurements where it where there's no deflection and then they get the you know deflection when they introduce other things they assume symmetry there and then they just get it right down the middle or you know that like that's how they derive the radius they just they're just look at it like they're intersecting a, uh, a sphere so from that measurement that's how they derive that then they apply it all together and then based off of that they can get the momentum and velocity, which allows them to derive the mass, because it's in you know it's just algebra where you can solve for that with New with Newton with Newton's equations. So that allows them to get the mass of the electron. Now, an important thing to know is like how do the ether people explain the the electron, right? So this is just the or you don't even have to be an ether person really. You can just look. I mean, but how how would you explain it as not a particle, right? Um, the, the this would just be the lowest at the time, right? This is 1897. This is the lowest amount of energy that they could detect or manipulate at the time, and so this is what serves as the fundamental basis for for their model, right? This is going to serve as the as the backbone, right? This is going to be the measurement. So you know how like the speed of light is the they say the speed of light is the same in all reference frames, so that they can use it as a measuring tool to build upon, right? So this is. This is their building block for the subatomic world. This is how they're going to get in there. All right, because now they have a charge and a mass and all that, and they, they describe it as it's negatively charged. Well, there's no negative charge, right? There's just high to low pressure mediation. So that's all that's describing. It's not carrying like an absence of charge or a vacuum of charge. Like, you know, that's just not, not what it is a lot. That, that creates a big misconception with it, the way that it's described now. All right, I think that covers everything for the old... The old electron. All right, so now that we have the merger of the subatomic world and we've quantized electromagnetic radiation, we have a new way to interpret things on the subatomic scale. 
and we're going to get into the process of the, of well now we're going to further break down that quantization so we can understand how they're going to apply it experimentally or you're like how they're going to use this framework for their experimental interpretation rather right because it's like the abstract mathematics is just like a conceptual model how are we going to find out if there's little baby particles and little tiny particles and stuff doing all that? All right, so an important equation moving forward is going to be E equals HV, and the H is Planck's constant. Sometimes you'll see it with a little line through it. That's just to reduce Planck's constant. It's just a different ratio of Planck's constant to make math easier for the lads. Um, but that's, that's what that represents, and we'll get into all that here in a second. So let's see. Energy, Planck's constant, times frequency, so just the, the vibration. You can think of uh, like megahertz, million cycles per second, gigahertz, billion cycles per second. So that would be that would be the frequencies. So using the frequency of electromagnetic radiation and Planck's co constant, you can calculatively quantize the momentum of a wave or quantize the momentum of a wave proportional to its frequency. And this in this expression is what they attribute to the physicality part of the photon in wave particle duality. All right, H, H comes from solving the black body radiation problem. And the black body radiation problem was when they were trying to determine the relationship between the temperature of a body and the, or I'm sorry, the temperature of a body emitting an amount of energy versus uh, how bright it is. Or no, temperature of a body and how much energy it, it emits. Sorry, nothing to do with that. All right, so here we have a, a scale to, to look at this. Uh, to look at what this constant is and what it's what it was derived from, right? So if you look at this curve, you see we've now introduced the energy of a light bulb, and we can see that this scale raised up a little bit. So now there's some there's some energy introduced. We introduce it to uh, we scale it to the sun now. We see now that there's more energy in uh, to account for in this curvature. So uh, the black body equation and then solving that or whatever was, or part of that was to explain this curvature with math, right? To explain this relationship. All right. Hello? Yo. All right. Yep. All right, sorry about that. I had a brief interruption. Okay, let's see here. Mm, okay, yeah, so the black body curve. So they had this data set. They had this curve that they had to explain. Uh, how do we do it? So Planck solved it now with this equation, with that E equals HV. Uh, let's see here. So this is from the law of distribution of energy on the normal spectrum. Uh, oops. Yeah, okay, so the energy element must be proportional to the to its frequency and thus E equals HV, all right? Now we have, now we go to the numerical values of the experimental data that was performed because as we see here, there's no time value in this, or uh, in the e equals HV equation, which will be uh, relevant for an analysis later. But, uh, but anyway, how does this, so this equation works, but it's like, how? Well, the data set was the total energy radiating into air one squared centimeter from a black body temperature in one second, right? So that's how they, uh, that was the data set. That's how this equation solves it. That's how it, that's how it applies. All right, and so Planck's constant is effectively the smallest amount of energy that, that electromagnetic radiation can emit in one second. This is the quantization value that is established proportional to the amount of the energy per second uh, in relation to its frequency. And once that, once that electromagnetic radiation has been quantized, each energy packet can then mathematically be utilized as the momentum for the photon proportional to its frequency, um, you know, with that data set, right? Because we got an oscillation rate from C from your boy Maxwell in a one second interval, right? 300 million meters per second. And then we have this derivation for the energy limit set to a one second data set. So. That's why these work. That's why they, uh, 
you know. Anyway. All right, so now we're gonna go over Einstein's contribution to quantum mechanics. And it was largely in this quanti this how he conceptualized the photon, essentially, right? His quantization of the conjugate electromagnetic field in electromagnetic radiation. So in his paper here, he gives um, R over N times beta V. And when you track down what the what these mean from this paper, you end up with E equals HV. So he's using Planck's uh, Planck's derivation and his energy and his energy constant to derive uh, how he's going to conceptualize the photon here. Okay. Okay. So we have okay. So we have where he's so we have where he's broken it down into discrete energy packets. Now, how are we going to turn those into uh, you know an actual particle that we interact with and use to measure other things and all that stuff. Well, that's where your boy Max Born comes in and re and gives his interpretation on Schrodinger's equations, which are wave equations, right? Explicitly talking about a wave and a vibration in a medium. And old Max Born says, if one translates the results of the particles, only one interpretation is possible. And then this is Schrodinger's wave equation here. And he says the prob uh, gives the probability for the electron. Then there's a correction here, um, so it's not quite that. It says after solving the collision of the or the, the collisions problems with Schrodinger's wave, wave equation, he states that the square of the function uh, the square of the wave function is the solution for the probability of the location of a pro of a uh, quantized el electron. Right. So that's how, and this is just his opinion. Right. There's no basis for this this is just he's just like oh you know what would be dope what we could do with this energy quantization that he broke down into a one second uh interval what if we could uh what, what if we could square it and just you know use that as a probability for where it could possibly be so that's cool that's cool and then he goes on to say if you're down with that if that sounds appealing to you then you have to give up on the world of determinism and you could never actually know where an atom's at. You just have to believe in the mathematics that's describing a wave interaction uh, as, as a quantized bit that you can't actually measure or actually uh, define. All right. So now that we've done all that, and uh, yep. Okay. So now that we've done all that. We will get into oh, one second. Hold on, I got a phone call. Hello? Yo, what up, Joe? Hey. Hey, Alan, you're still live. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I was, I was <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> that's cool. That's yeah, cool. Let, yeah, let this me check. Hilarious, dude. Let me check his. Let me. Down to a point where can yeah, let me check his schedule real quick. Universe on that. Jokes on I wonder me. if that's Joe Ro. <laughs> dude, oh, it's a secret. Actually, that was Joe Rogan, dude. I'm confirming that Yo. right now. Oh, uh, dude, you ruined it, Shane. No, you muted me. Joe, it was Rogan. You ruined it, bro. You fuck. <laughs> you you <laughs> muted me. Joe Rogan Sorry. was calling me, bro. Thanks. I thought that you were fucking really out of nowhere. No, man. Ah, right. uh, dude, we thought that was legit. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it's Andrew. Andrew made me think it was legit. It's it was stuff. until I realized I was muted and you couldn't hear me and Shane was talking over me and there was no coherent audio and it was ruined. So that sucks. All right. So moving on. Oh, God. So we're going to go over the experimental evidence here for the quantization of all the, for, of the photon first, right? To see if Einstein's got it right. And this is a tier list given for, or, you know, in my opinion, so we got double DS tier for the double slit experiment, double DS tier for the quantum eraser experiment and S tier for the quantum scattering, right? Cause we'll get, and I think when we get to the significance or when we get to the next part, you'll understand why uh, I rated it this way. And all right, cool. All right, so this is the apparatus, or this is a sim similar to the apparatus that Compton would have used for his scattering and whatnot, but that's uh, the wrong slide. So we'll actually skip ahead to the An experiment slide. that anyone. All right. 
So this is going to be covering the double slit experiment and the quantum eraser experiment. Now the quantum eraser experiment is dependent on wave superpositioning, which we'll get into in a bit. But uh, through this, he breaks it down pretty well and demonstrates that we, and gives a demonstration that there's no wave superpositioning. So we'll move forward from there. So enjoy this next portion. And I'm going to tap out for a second. An experiment that anyone can do is the double slit experiment. And this is the absolute best experimental evidence against the existence of photons. So here is the basic setup for this experiment. We have a red laser pointer and a diffraction slide. The red laser pointer is a 650 nanometer wavelength. The diffraction slide was purchased from Amazon and is made by 3B Scientific. And here's a close-up of the diffraction slide. So now we can see the wave interference pattern that is created when the coherent light source, or the laser, is shot through this diffraction slide or through the double slit. You have the highest intensity light near the middle, and then you can see the bands of destructive interference where there is no light. So these waves interfered with each other and canceled each other out. And then bands of constructive interference where the light waves add to themselves. So light being a wave through a medium which causes an interference pattern explains this experiment logically. It only gets weird when you add in Einstein's confusion around photon particles and the illogical concept of wave-particle duality for light. So let's go ahead and play along with the idea of the photon particle applied to this experiment. There are plenty of videos that already go into detail about the double slit experiment, but this Dr. Quantum animation seems to be a very popular one. And you can see right here, if you are shooting the idea of photon particles through the double slit, you would end up with two dots or two bands, as shown here. But when you do the experiment in real life, you don't see the two bands of these photon projectile particles. So then how do you explain photons making this interference pattern? It is because the photons are in a quantum state superposition. And while in that state, a single photon can pass through both slits at the same exact time and interfere with itself. This allows us to see the photon particles in an interference pattern like this because it is in a quantum state superposition at this time. So if the photon's quantum state superposition were to decohere right now, then it would go back to the two blobs that we saw on the Dr. Quantum picture. As you can see, this is some of the quantum weirdness that people talk about. Sure, it's weird, but it's because it's wrong, not because this is how nature works. So from a particle perspective, you're looking at a fully cohered quantum state superposition of photons. What I'm going to do now is add more noise to this environment to try to decohere this quantum state superposition of photons. Now, why would I do this? This is why quantum computing is not working, is based upon noise in the environment. Quantum computers are not working because they are having trouble maintaining quantum state superposition. And their reasoning is because there is external noise in the environment that is decohering the superposition that they're trying to maintain inside these computers. So why am I able to maintain this quantum state superposition of photons? So someone that understands the story of quantum physics 
would probably think I'm an idiot for using a heat gun because in order to collapse the quantum state superposition, I need to measure the photons, not try to heat them up. So if you try to measure which slit the photon passed through, then that will collapse the photon's quantum state superposition. It makes sense because somehow photon particles of light know when they're being measured. Yeah, sure, right. This is confusing because it's wrong. I want to mention these variations of the double slit experiment because they seem to be very popular. First of all, the which way did the photon go experiment was a thought experiment. Try to find a single photon detector that can detect which side a single photon went through. Again, try to find the definition of what a single photon is. None of this exists. You might see some of these experiments using polarizer material to mark photons as they go through each slit. But this is physically interfering with the light waves. It has nothing to do with photons. As light passes through the material, it can slow down or be absorbed, which is physical interference, not a measurement. And then the quantum eraser variations that I've seen rely on quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement requires quantum superposition to be a real thing. So we're just going further off the deep end with these experimental variations of the double slit experiment. You can see the two sides of the beam interfere and cancel out. Again, just like a wave should. Seeing this was the first time that I actually felt in my gut that light is somehow wave-like. Up until now, I just thought that the waves of quantum mechanics were abstract and they're not. They're actually there and you can see pretty clear evidence of them. And so since then, I've started taking the whole wave picture much more seriously. On the other hand, I've become more cautious about imagining light as particles. Photons are much more nuanced clearly than I thought before, and I want to try and do experiments with them as well to understand how I should be thinking of them. All right, cool. And we got one more video. The audio on that was good. Uh, yeah, it was on my end. All right, we got one more. This video is about... So we're going to skip to a specific time. So this is on quantum state superposition, right? So all this, all these supplemental things hinge on uh, quantum state superposition. So we're looking at the breakdown of that right now and the evidence put forward for the correctness of that. And uh, our boy, It's BS, is going to give a rundown on that real quick. So we're gonna watch a couple clips from, from this presentation that he did, starting from five minutes. Oh, look, Toby, there's a, there's a cat. <laughs> You see that? <laughs> now, think of an achieved computer understanding the rest of this video. Detail about why the photon particle is incorrect. But this is not a prerequisite for understanding the rest of this video. Okay, so now I will demonstrate how a classical computer works and how a quantum computer is supposed to work. Here we have a basic diagram of how your computer performs logic. We have two bits of information that you can think of as being stored in the computer memory, or RAM. These are connected by wires that go to a logic gate. You can think of this gate as being a processor, or CPU. This is the output wire from the processor that in this example is just connected to an LED light. This computer has four possible states that this processor can take as inputs. The logic is based on this wire being turned on and this wire being turned on at the same time. 
when this occurs, it will turn on the output wire that lights up the LED. So your computer has to send in each one of these states one at a time. So let's try this out. First we have the 00, zero state and then we're going to have the zero 01 state and you can see that this wire became electrified. Now let's have the 10 state and then let's send in the last state or the fourth state 1 1. Both wires are electrified. The processor took this input and then turned on the output to make the LED light up. That's how a normal classical computer works and anybody can understand that. This is called digital logic. So now let me try to describe what I call quantum illogic. Instead of using four separate steps to input these states into the logic gate, a quantum computer will set these bits in a quantum state superposition. Now what that means is they can be 0 and 1 at the same time. And if they are 0 and 1 at the same time, then you can send that quantum state superposition into the input of a quantum gate. This allows you to skip the four separate steps and just do it all at once. This is referred to as quantum parallelism or the parallel processing advantage that you get over classical computing. So the first problem with this is how would you ever know that these are actually in a quantum state superposition where they're both 0 and 1 at the same time? Because by definition, if you look at these bits or observe them or interact with them, what happens is that superposition collapses down to a classical bit state. In other words, you'll always see a 0 or a 1. You'll never see 0 and 1 at the same time, by definition. Again, the quantum computer has the advantage of sending all four states in a single step instead of sending each state one at a time. This is where quantum computing breaks down because quantum state superpositions do not exist. But let's keep following along. So you can apply quantum logic gates to this superposition of states and somehow it doesn't disturb or observe the system. And then when you decide to take a measurement, the output of the gate is just one of the possible states. You don't ever have access to this superposition of all states. Now, if that's confusing to you, don't worry, because quantum computing is illogical and wrong. Well said. We're going to skip to another portion of the video real quick. a FET simulation of waves. Schrodinger's equation describes wave systems, so I'm going to send a single pulse down the line and then a second one. I'm going to pause it right here and explain. I have a reference line set up here so you can see the height or the amplitude of these waves, and then I can step them together and show you the constructive interference that occurs when two waves hit each other. At this point in time, we have a superposition of waves, and you can just think of this as waves of water. As we keep moving forward in time, the waves will go through each other and go back to their normal amplitude or normal height. Since Schrodinger's equation is designed to describe wave systems, you can see how naturally wave superposition is built right into this equation. Now, let's unnaturally force the idea of an electron particle into this equation. Now, let's make this an electron and this an electron, and you can think of it as billiard balls. 
let's step them closer together. And at this point, how are you going to describe these objects coming together as one? This is where you have to get creative and make something up like quantum state superposition. How can these billiard balls or electrons occupy the same space and time, pass through each other, and keep moving? This video is a... All right, I'm back. One second. That was an awesome breakdown. Yeah. That dude's yeah. the man, huh? Dude, he's a legend. He's a legend. I click on video. All right. Let's see. Okay, so that was quantum computing, right? So we're going to see the the propaganda, right? We're going to see, or, you know, what I... We're going to see what they're putting out for their proof of, you know, quantum computing and all that after we've just seen um, how it makes no sense logically and how when you go to compute it and do the measurement, you're never getting a quantum, any, you, you're never proving anything about that, right? So what Google put out was a paper on their quantum super, quantum supremacy and programmable superconducting process or whatever. And all they did was take a sample data set from from their, from their circuits, you know, like the output that was already measured and determined somehow that that was a proof of superposition, right? So this is, this is a fraudulent industry. You can see like over, what's it been over 10 years, they've spent like $30 billion. Like there's nothing to show for it. Uh, I forget what country it was. I was just looking at it the other day, but some of the, some country had a, had a huge investment in quantum computing and they just tanked it. They were like, yeah, this isn't, is going nowhere. So in our, earlier, what he was talking about with the um, with heating up the uh, heating up the the photons, right? Well, what they say, you know, the big issue with these quantum computers is is ambient the ambient temperature creates a problem. They have to cool these things down to like you know the lowest possible temperature that they can conceive of, and and all this to do these quantum super uh, calculations where they're not actually calculating because they're doing parallelism interference or whatever. But, uh, you know, all of that is disturbed by ambient temperature or whatever, right? So when you, it, when you uh, introduce heat to the double slit experiment, you should see the, like, that should collapse the, the wave and you should see, like, you should, the diffraction pattern should change, but it doesn't. So it's not, not real at all. So there's, like, like he so eloquently said, <clears throat> there's no reason to further go down the rabbit hole. All right to like oh now it's now it's changing its direction based on our consciousness dude yeah dude all right so let's see so that was from google now we're going to get into the epr paradox so this is the einstein podolsky rosenberg or rosenthal i can't remember paradox where um heisenberg harris heisenberg's uncertainty principle this quantum entanglement was mathematically disproven by Einstein and the lads. So using Schrodinger's equation here, what they do is they, uh, well, because as, as he was just describing, like what that, um, how it describes like the the wave function, right? Like the, or the, the wave system, right? What they're gonna do here is they have two system, oh, oops, on the wrong slide. Schrodinger's wave equation, precise momentum. Oh yeah, so real quick, Heisenberg, I forgot to include this slide, but I made a note for it. So Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is the more precisely you know the momentum of you know whatever you're trying to measure, the less precisely you can know its physical location for the electron. So you can't measure superposition without causing it to collapse is the is the idea, right? But what what Einstein and the lads show here mathematically is that you can totally do it. So the 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 wave functions describe two systems. So when you take the time of their interaction, what we saw in the video, when they're at that point when they're um, when they're when it would be two part when the two billiard ball two billiard balls should be colliding, like at that point, and then the point after, right? When you take a measurement, they're saying that if you take a measurement before, you can you know you can when you plug that into the entanglement math, it will output the location for the uh, secondary system without disturbing it. 
and they you know prove that uh, with the math and so what was the result of that well Dirac and Heisenberg couldn't refute the couldn't refute that so we're going to look at an interview after the you know years after the fact where they ended up going on with it anyway which will lead us into the Compton experiment or Compton or Compton scattering sorry so by measuring the you know, particle mass Okay, yeah, so to recap there, by measuring the first particle, right, or the first wave, you can use the entanglement math to reveal the properties of the second system without disturbing it. All right, so that was irrefutable. So let me see, this is kind of small on my screen. So let me look over here, this screen. Okay, so this is a clip from the, from the interview with Bohr, right? So this is Peterson, this is the interviewer, and this is Nas Bohr. So this paradox did not, this, this paradox, it did not seem to have an effect on the philosophers and the uh, the philosophers. It also provoked great stir amongst the physicists, didn't it? Bohr says, "Yeah, it sure did." Uh, Heisenberg, you know, got pissed off and wrote and wrote, you know, against Einstein about it. And then he says, "Oh no way!" He he spoke out against Einstein. And then he says, "Yeah," but then he realized that is that what he was saying was nonsense because he made a mistake in his math, so he couldn't actually refute Einstein. Then he says, so did Dirac somehow think of a scheme or somehow think that the whole scheme of quantum mechanics would have to be given up? And he says, he says at the time, it, at the time uh, it was conceived that he, he would have to do so, but I talked him out of it. Then Peterson says, so Dirac was prepared to give it all up. And then Bohr says, yes, that is very nice. And I don't know what he was prepared to do because it was nothing, but he found out that one could do similar things with spin and it felt so odd that it could not work. So he was pretty distraught over this whole thing, with all, the whole EPR paradox. And then we get into uh, why they, why he didn't give it up, right? So Peterson here, says, didn't it surprise you? Let's see, didn't it surprise you of all people that Dirac should comment? And then he says, no, because that, or commit, sorry. No, because Dirac had been dealing with similar things. There was an American man who made a very bad experiment on the Compton effect and found that there was no correlation in the energy. And Dirac wrote Nature Magazine or the Nature Publication and said said that that was nice because he could get he he could get over the troubles of quantum mechanics. He could give up on it, right? Because the, everything is going to hinge on this uh, moving forward. So. Bohr writes to nature and he says, no, this is a misunderstanding. <laughs> and then uh, I guess he says here that he convinced, uh, what's his name, Dirac to do the same, to, re to basically retract their statements and then and, and give a positive review or whatever, right? And then he says, in the Compton effect, you know, at this point, it actually has an energy. In the Compton effect, you know, the point is, is this, that you actually have this correlation in the energy, right? So this is the significance of this. This brought the homie back. This is what, when people say, um, you know, a, a photon doesn't need a medium to propagate in, this is what this is all based off of. This is the root of it. Because when you look at quantum state, or I mean, when you look at the double slit experiment, quantum eraser, when you look at all these things, um, they're not, they're not, they're like, they're not good experience. They're not good representations of everything. Like you can argue against them very easily. Um, you know, with a hairdryer. Now this, the Compton effect is a little different. This is a, this is much more significant for them. One second, I need some water. All right, everything we learned thus far has been to get us here to this Compton effect experiment because this is what everything hinges on. So everything... Um, so you, using Einstein's conception of the photon as discrete packets of, of energy quantized as massless waves that math, to mathematically derive momentum to explain the physical inter, to explain a physical interaction with subatomic particles, i.e., the electron. And then the you know so that's where that brings in the electron with this. And then the mathematical representation of the wave particle duality is then used to explain Compton scattering as a mutually exclusive representation of relativistic physics because they have to use four vector math, which we'll get into in a minute. And uh, so that's their proof of the photon. 
and then the and the quantization of the electromagnetic radiation as a you know discrete energy packet that carries momentum and the subatomic particle collision of the electron right so this is the uh, explanation for these two things so this is arthur compton here 1892 to 18 or to 1962 and he's got a he's got some accolades here very famous lad he was part of the manhattan project as well we had a bunch of boosted credibility off of that and if you want to get into the history real quick well we're not but there's an interesting history of the people that came out of the manhattan project and all these quantum lads that got together and kind of put forward this entire model and everything um, i'll have a link in the description um so you guys can check out that video. This guy goes over the history of it, and it's pretty interesting. But basically, after you know, what was it, the Manhattan Project, and the and all that, uh, these guys were like rock stars, right? So they had a lot of leadway and everything, you know, academically and whatnot, and career-wise. So, what is the Compton effect, right? When a photon emits energy, it's likely that it will, that it will interact with you know, that. that that it will interact with the atomic electron. According to, cl to the classical theory, the electron will oscillate. The electron, the electrons will oscillate at the photon's frequency because of the uh, because of the interaction of the electron with the magnetic field of the photon, and it will radiate electromagnetic uh, photons. So they're saying that it'll collide. It'll give some of its energy to the electron and elevate it to. A, a photon so it'll give off uh, energy of the same frequency. This is called Thomson scattering. However, in the early 1920s, Arthur Compton experimentally confirmed by observation by J. Or J. A. Gray that especially at backward scattering angles, there appears to be a component of the emitted radiation called a modified wave that has a longer wavelength than the original unmodified wave Classical electromagnetic theory cannot explain this modified wave. Compton then admitted, or uh, admitted, that's funny. <laughs> Compton then attempted to understand this theoretical process, and the only explanation he could provide was that Einstein's photon principle must be correct as the scattering shows. Uh, and we'll get into what that means and the math that he used for it here in a second. So this is a the Wikipedia overview of what happens. So we have an X-ray tube emitting X-rays. We have a graphite target for a deflection. It's gonna pass through this shielding. It's gonna hit a single crystal. Then it's gonna hit an ionization chamber. And the, what they're looking for is the, the exchange here with this crystal. They're saying that we know the wavelength coming out in, you know, of the, of the X-ray, of the electromagnetic radiation. It's gonna hit this, it's gonna bounce. And when it hits this, it's gonna interact with the electron. There's gonna be some interactions here. And we're gonna take measurements and see what we find out. And this ionization chamber is going to convert the electromagnetic radiation into an electric signal where they can take the measurements. And then that's how they'll, then they'll, uh, you know, correspond, they'll, uh, from that they'll determine you know, okay, if the wavelength was X, Y, Z, it would be this much energy, blah, 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 right? So that's how they that's how they do it. Or that's how we did it for the measurement. And he came to the conclusion that doing this, that this could only be explained through relativity given the model provided by him, right? So we have a little diagram provided for us of the of the photon. Now the photon is represented here in waveform. They don't they didn't want the to make the diagram not confusing, they don't have it as two particles or whatever, right? So this Stationary, this ball here is supposed to be a free electron and it's supposed to be stationary with no kinetic energy. And the electromagnetic radiation hits the old photon. You have your old recoiled electron, right? This, you know, this makes sense. They're saying this is all good. But then we also have this scattered photon, right? We have some additional energy output here. And this wavelength is higher than what this recoil wavelength is. And how do we? How doth I explain that within our model unless we use relativistic four vector math and unless we invoke that the, uh, the that the free electron has no kinetic energy and it's just stationary, all these things, right? So they put these equations together and they, you know, solve it and they're like, oh my God, no way. 
relativity, the photon and quantum mechanics and, and the electron are all super true. So that's how they, that's how they get there. Okay. I think that's pretty much it. So here's the equation in question that, uh, that old Com that old Arthur Compton derived to expl to explain this. So Lambda prime is the wavelength of the scattered photon. Lambda is the wavelength of the incident photon. H is your boy Planck's constant. Shout out to him. Me is the mass of the electron. C is the speed of light in a vacuum. And the one minus the cosine theta is the angle between the direction of the incident photon and the direction of the scattered photon, right? And this is the, this is the end result of a very long process that I'll show you guys here in a minute. Okay, so the success of Compton's theory convincingly demonstrated the correctness of both quantum mechanics and the particle nature of the photon. The use of the conservation laws of energy and momentum applied relativistically to a point-like scattering photon from an electron finally uh, convinced the great majority of scientists the validity of the new modern era. Whatever, right? Because what they're what we're going to get in here into with this four vector thing is that the traditional way that they would explain it was they would use three vectors, right? So they give you an X, Y, Z. They would give you an arrow for your magnitude. They would this, the length of the arrow, the thickness, and all that would represent things like the magnitude of velocity, the direction, um, you know, how fast it is, et cetera, stuff like that, right? And then for the relativistic four vector, right, they introduced that time axis. So they got X, Y, Z, T. The only problem is you can't really conceptualize that in any meaningful way uh, with a diagram, right? So it ends up just turning in to this, which just, which is a ton of, you know, mathematics where they can, it's just, you know, just pure math at that point, right? It's the only way that you can describe it because as, as we just said here, this is a, uh, the way that they describe the time variable in the four vector is it's like, you know, basically dot points or what do they call it? Dot products. So just like points instead of like uh, physical quantities that represent things. Um, so this was, this was proof that they were like on the right track with everything because that's how they, you know, conceptualized the, the you know, this interaction, right? So this is a gentleman uh, working out that, working out that equation and the, and what we just described here. And then that was the four vector, three vector. And then now we have, so our guy here arrives at the solution finally. So after all that, he got there to uh, lambda prime minus lambda equals all that. So that was very cool. So now we're going to watch another video real quick, a little five, what is that, a six minuter on the, on the experiment and a quick overview of the math derivation. Derivation. Derivation, sorry. All right, here we go, one second. Compton effect. The Compton effect describes the change in the wavelength of photons when scattered by electrically charged particles, for example electrons, as a function of the scattering angle. The observation can easily be explained in the particle picture by energy and momentum conservation. The effect was discovered in 1922 by Arthur Holly Compton when X-rays were applied to crystals. He received the Nobel Prize in Physics for this in 1927. The experimental setup consists of an X-ray tube with a molybdenum anode, a perspex disc, and an X-ray detector mounted rotatably around the disc. The X-ray tube is operated at 35 kV acceleration voltage and 1 mA tube current. In the X-ray tube, free electrons are generated at the cathode. The electrons are accelerated and hit the inclined molybdenum anode. By decelerating them, meaning negative acceleration, X-rays are generated there. Molybdenum has in its characteristic spectrum at 17.44 kiloelectron volts and the less intensive K-beta line at 19.65 kiloelectron volts. The photons of the X-rays hit the perspex disk at a wavelength between 10 to the power of minus 8 
and 10 to the power of minus 12 meters and are scattered. The resulting energy spectrum is measured by the X-ray detector. First, the primary spectrum is measured at a count rate versus channel number at a scattering angle of 0 degree. Then, the X-ray detector is turned to 60 degrees and the energy spectrum is measured again. Then, the X-ray detector is turned to 120 degrees and the energy spectrum is measured again. Based on the known energy of the K-alpha and K-beta line, the measured spectra can be calibrated from count rate versus channel number to count rate versus photon energy. It can be seen that the energy of photons during the scattering process changes depending on the scattering angle. We consider the energy of the scattered photons from the K-alpha line and show how the scattering angle and the energy of the scattered photons relate. We consider the energy of the scattered photons from the K-alpha line at a scattering angle of 0 degrees, the energy of the scattered photons is 17.44 kilo electron volts. At 30 degrees, it is 17.40 kilo electron volts. At 60 degrees, it's 17.16 kilo electron volts. At 90 degrees, it's 16.95 kilo electron volts. At 120 degrees, it's 16.55 kilo electron volts. At 150 degrees, it is 16.45 kilo electron volts. The effect can easily be explained in the particle picture. The electrons can be assumed to be at rest before the scattering. If the photon collides with the electron, it transfers a part of its energy and the electron receives kinetic energy. So the energy balance before and after the collision is shown here. The energy of the photon with a frequency nu before the collision is equal to the energy of the photon with a frequency nu prime plus the kinetic energy of the electron after the collision. The momentum of relativistic particles is p is equal to h times nu divided by c. The following applies to the energy. E is equal to h times nu is equal to p times c. This means for the conservation of momentum, p is equal to p prime plus p e. For the momentum of the electrons follows. p e square is equal to left bracket p minus p prime right bracket is equal to p square plus p prime square minus 2 times p times p prime. The energy of the electron before the impact is E is Me times C squared with the rest mass Me. After the, the collision electron. it changes due to the momentum transfer to left bracket Me squared times C to the power of 4 plus Pe squared times C squared right bracket to the power of a half. Thus the conservation of energy yields H times nu plus Me C squared is equal to h times nu prime plus left bracket m e square times c to the power of 4 plus p e square c square right bracket to the power of a half. By rearranging and inserting the square of the electron momentum with nu is c divided by lambda, we get lambda prime minus lambda is equal to h divided by m e times c left bracket 1 minus cosine theta. Right bracket. As can be seen in comparison to our measurements, this calculation can describe the measured data very well. The Compton effect can only be explained in the particle picture of quantum theory, but not in the wave picture. This effect is a key experiment in quantum theory. The experiment was the first proof after the photoelectric effect for the particle behavior of radiation. All right, so shout out to her. So we're all caught up on uh, what's being put forward and what they're saying out of this, or, you know, like what the stakes are here. So let's see here. So we got the Compton scattering, critical flaw in the formula with the, so the assumption, the huge assumption here is that the electron is at rest, uh, you know, for, for their model, like they're creating a specific, conditions for them to calculate under, right? So let's see now in classical mechanics, you can, I found a paper where the, the, the only di, like where it, where it starts to deviate from classical mechanics is when the angle is greater than 60 degrees. So 
<clears throat> within that, it's identical to the quote unquote relativistic four vector four vector predictions, right? Now, in at, at angles greater than sixty degrees, what's happening here? Like, what's what, what are they doing? So, what what this guy what Chan Chu points out uh, in his paper is that you can't well for one you can't ignore you can't say that the initial electron is not being uh, is not relevant. So we'll read here. So, but there is a critical flaw in the derivation of the Compton formula that should render the formula dubious. The derivation for the Compton or or in the derivation, Compton assumes that the scattering electron is initially at rest. In the original experiment, Compton used a carbon graphite, or, yeah, graphite as the as the scatter target. The ionization energy or the ionization energy of the carbon is about eleven point three electron volts, and the and also the kinetic energy of the of the least bound electron in the atom. If the scattering is of an angle of ten degrees, then the energy lost to the X-ray photon would have ended up as recoil energy scattered from the electron around 9.04 electron volts. This, sh this shows that the initial kinetic energy of the scattering electron is not insignificant and should not be ignored. So you can't just assume uh, that that's what's happening right here just because it, it fits the energy output on the measurement, which we're going to get into next. Okay, so here we have... Can this use, let's see. Okay, cool. So we have here the collision of particles of the light of the photon and the orbital electron. All right, it's treated as a collision between classical particles. Uh, Compton introduced his light of quantum hypothesis, right? So he's this is how he's answering the the experiment. This is his interpretation of it. So he's saying that based off of this. You know, energy of the photon for the frequency is Planck's constant, and the light has a momentum, so we'll use this. And then Compton's derivation of his formula was simply an application of the conservation based on the above hypothesis, the relativistic for... Oh, actually, you know what? Disregard that. That argument, there, this part of the argument, um, that, in that video we just watched, that lady kind of covered it, and I don't, I don't know about that. So give me one second. So... We still have the assumption that it's at rest. This was in relation to what the proofs would be based off of the derivation on how he considered the momentum, but I think she covered it in a way that nullifies what he was trying to say. So, um, cool. Let's see. Yeah, it will be shown that the scattering cannot be assumed. All right, so so Compton may have cooked the books a little bit with the kinetic energy and used the relativistic derivative. Oh, okay, nope, that was part that was that's being cut. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so the gamma ray photon in the center. Okay, so now we're going to get into how the measurements are made. These detectors, right? Because the, we're talking, we saw diagrams of wavelengths. We saw, we heard a lot of things like. The scattered wavelength is, you know, we can only be explained something about a wavelength. There's lots of mentions of waves and wavelengths. Now is a, now we need to know is a wavelength actually being measured here or is something else going on? So this was also pointed out the measurement process. So we're going to take a look here. So these experiments employ modern sense, modern energy sensors to measure the energy of the scattered gamma ray pulses for various angles. The they are, these are commercial detectors. They may be NAI uh, scintill scintillination detectors or semiconductor uh, germanium detector. These detectors basically convert electrical signals into, um, or basically convert ionization from the radiation into electrical signals, which they're using to convert. And then, and then out of the, out of the electrical signal that they're reading, they're like, oh, okay, the wavelength was this going in. It would have been this when it hit it. If we got this free electron, so this is how they're like, we got this much left over. So what do we do with it? Oh, this can only, you know, so this is how we've got here, right? They've never actually measured the wavelength that's produced by this uh, interaction, which is, you know, very significant, right? Because this is the whole, 
you know, purpose of it. This would be, this would be like an actual confirmation of it. Someone's hot mic in. Let's see. Okay. So the other Okay. So from these electrical pulses, the energy figure for the gamma ray pulse is derived, right? So these detectors need calibration to map the electrical voltage for the energy values. So the calibration parameters used uh, all use embedded software for their for, the, for their detectors. The detectors are not impartial to measuring energy pulses from the gamma rays. They may be calibrated or they may be calibrated to be consistent with the relativistic scattering, right? And he gives the relativistic derivation there. Or for the classic formula, and there's the classical way to conserve energy and momentum, or momentum, or, and, and the experimental results would now be dependent on how the commercial manufacturers, div, you know, embedded in their software, right? So you, what he's saying there is you could still get it, right? Because it, it's just energy output dependent on the calibration. So... Now you, so we need to measure the wavelength. Now we need to know for sure. Right. We can't just, can't just speculate. Right. All right. So we'll look at a diagram of the modern ones that they use, right. Because they repeat this experiment, you know, in labs all over the world and use this as, you know, for other purposes and stuff. So this is, um, you know, they're like, how could you explain it? Like, I've done the experiment myself. Well, that's it. The detector on the, in the apparatus. So this is the ionization chamber. I forgot to, or I didn't highlight the, the detector would be over here on the arm. So uh, that's it. It's just converting ionization into electric signals. And based off of that is, you know, is how they're determining like, okay, it hit this electron and all that using a sensor. So We'll take a look at a couple of the sensors here. Usually the, the sensor of the sensor arm in the Geiger Muller counter or yeah, counter tube while on the target arm of the crystal of the scattered body or the observer or absor absorber is pivoted and is targeted as the target or turned as the target. <clears throat> the rate for the meter of the Geiger Muller counter Cube has been has also been integrated, right? So there's also like a decay rate of the uh, electromagnetic radiation that builds up, and that, that they also monitor that. With this, let's see. So there's a lot going on in this, a lot of processes going on in here. So this is just more on the tube. So it updates every one second, uh, and it's just count. It's just counting these pulses, right? No, no wavelengths, right? And so then we have. Uh, what this particular one looks like, this is the Geiger Muller. So this is the ionization chamber. The radiation comes in, ionizes, converts into electric, gives them the reading. And that's where they're like, oh, okay, this, you know, we've been through it. So this is the uh, senilitator, right? So it's actually doing the exact same thing pretty much. And it's just converting the electric signal in the photomultiplier tube is what they call it. And then from that output, they deter they reverse engineer what would be what it, what would the wavelength have been if it blah 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 right so i don't think we need so to be like a scintillator a scintillator scintillator yeah scintill scintillator scintillator all right so these experiments employ modern energy sensors Okay, so yeah, we've already been over and I kind of repeated it a bunch of times, but it is the core part of this because everything hinges on this and you could literally get the results you want by imposing specific mathematical conditions to it. You can also derive it classically. Um, and then only at certain angles does it deviate based off of the, uh, you know, electron model and all that uh, interaction and how they're and how they're calculating it. Um, so, a uh, we really need the wavelength to be measured here. That's the core principle of this because all of this is still explainable by classical mechanics. Like, and who knows if this, if that effect is even, you know, has any meaning in it, right? At that, at that point, if you don't, if you're not even measuring the wavelength, you can't even source back what the actual, uh, <laughs> you can't do anything with it, right? So the favorable assumptions, yeah, so yeah, they, they just impose favorable conditions, right? So I would like to impose some favorable conditions myself, right? 
what if the universe was made of tiny cats? Tiny little adorable cats. You could represent the cats in a sleep state. You know, you could have a little superposition. The cat could also be in the awake state. And you could never know, you could never truly know if the cat is awake or asleep until you go, come here, kitty, 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 come here. Come here, girl. Are you here? Those are, those are pictures of my cats. So, all right. So that's a wave cat, or that's a cat duality. And I don't know if it's, you know, an accurate theory or whatever, but I am working with an Italian particle physicist and we look forward to announcing successful measurements of the Catron. And we have an accurate, we have a precision of one in, you know, one billion zillion, but an accuracy of about 0.00004%. So there could be some play there um, on the theory. We'll see what happens next. And we're going, so in a future presentation, we're going to be looking at electron interferometry, neutrino and neutron interferometry, and how they follow the Sagnac effect. Because all these particles and whatnot are supposed to be different from one another, but slightly coming from, but slightly somehow all interchangeable. But uh, this, I think that I can make a good case that they all come from the same primary substrate and it's not um, different interactions of particles colliding and all that. It's all just different energy states of a wave as represented by all the equations that they use to actually solve everything and not play hide the electron with a probability function squaring the solution of what was already derived for a wave based off of what's what it's waving in. All right, any questions, comments, or concerns? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how I could possibly disagree with your cat theory. <laughs> well, if I introduce enough math, I don't think anyone could. <laughs> Uh, man. So with the, uh, what was the apparatus called there? The, uh, the Compton scattering. So the, actually the scintillator, I suppose, is really what it comes down to, huh? Like at the end of the day, isn't that kind of like where the whole quantif the whole quantification of all of it comes down to the scintillator, right? Uh, the measurement. Yeah. Not just the scintillator because they don't, um, so the scintillator was part of the, uh, Where's my scintillator at? Jesus. Oh, that's not it. There it is. There it is, yeah. Sorry about that. I was just like hitting random things going back and forth, pretending I knew what I was doing. Yeah, so there's the old scintillator here. But yeah, it's doing the exact same thing. It's just converting um, the energy into electric signals. Okay. And then I actually have some extended notes here that I didn't really read off because I already uh, went into it. But would you like, to, would you like some notes? Yeah, sure. sure. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah. All right. The, the scintillator or scintillator, scintillation, whatever, right? The, the, <laughs> the, scint the scintillator detector uses a sodium iode, iod sodium iode. And let's see, it's commonly used for the detection of radiation measurements. It uses, yeah, I'll just send it to you, bro. <laughs> that sounds good. Cool. Like it's, it's just like basic level, you know, how it works, what it is. But yeah, it's just it's there. What the main takeaway, though, is that the process of measurement is converting the uh, electromagnetic radiation into an electric signal. And they're not actually mm -hmm. measuring the wavelength that they say, so it could be anything, right? So it could like they, the electron, you know, in their model could be moving or whatever. Like they could, there's many ways to slice this cake as they say. Right. But, um, hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so, huh. Yeah, this is really like I'm going to I'm going to need to mull on this for a little bit cuz so I'm just wondering like yeah it just seems so hmm I need to, I I'm going to have to look at your notes on this. Cool. Cuz I really am curious about how you quantify like you, there must be a maximum and minimum frequency from which you could 
have an accurate quantization or actual accurate uh, quantification of uh, your measurement. Because once the free, once the the wave the waveforms are too large or too small, or I guess maybe too large would be the bigger problem, then I would think that the scintillator could no longer uh, accurately. Yes, I, I'll just have to look into it, into those notes. I'm just kind of curious. Cool. Yeah. So they do, um, and the modern experiments they do, they don't, they don't even use, um, what is it? The same radiation that Compton used. They use a, a different type. I forget, but um, the difference there though is is in the wavelength. And classical mechanics explains the wavelength and all those fine. It's only when it, it's only at that higher wavelength and at a specific angle, like when it's greater than sixty degrees, when we get into this issue, that's still explainable by everything really. What do you mean everything really? Oh, just I'm sorry, just classical mechanics. Because mm, mm. you're because yeah. the only the only reason it doesn't is because you're assuming that the electron has no kinetic energy to offer. So you're assuming that the that the that the leftover energy in the measurement is due to this. Gotcha. Okay. Or is due to their interpretation rather, right? So, yeah, that's uh, that's it. Excellent. Cool. Anyone else? Any questions? Any thoughts before we wrap up? All right. Well, then I guess not. Uh, we can go ahead and close it out then. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in to uh, an examination of the fundamentals of a quantum electrodynamics. Please, if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, uh, any input, just go ahead and provide it in the comments below. We love getting feedback. Uh, and yeah, thanks for, thanks for being here. And we will see you all on Thursday for reading night. Uh, there's a few possibilities for what we'll be reading. So we'll just wait to go ahead and announce that, whatever that will be. And yeah, we'll see you then. Take care. Yep. And then Friday will be Flat Earth Fridays. Oh, yes. Flat Earth Fridays. Shout out Levelheads. Take care of y'all.